Welcome to the Business Risk Index with Creditor Watch. We'll be looking at data insights from January. Um, a lot of the data obviously goes very quiet through December and Jan, but there's still some really important uh, pieces of uh, insights that's come out, not just from obviously Creditor Watch, but of course from um, the RBA and, and also looking at jobs as well. So just a reminder, Creditor Watch is a end-to-end -end credit risk management solution. So we are a credit reporting agency, but we've also got a selection of tools on either side of the credit risk management piece around onboarding your customers and collecting from them as well. So take a look at that for those of you who are not familiar. And of course, the one thing that allows us to um, fit here today and present the business risk index is our unique data. So we're collecting a huge amount of data from various sources um, around Australia, public, private, um, and data sources that we've obviously sourced ourselves. The way we break it up, two types of data, common data, so obviously ASIC, Australian Taxation Office, court actions, et cetera, on the right-hand side there, and then our unique data, so data that's unique to Creditor Watch that isn't found anywhere else. Obviously, that all powers our credit reports, credit ratings, credit scores. Um, that information is coming from our extensive customer database, but also data sources, proprietary data sources that we've found and are ingesting on a regular basis. But let's get into it. I've got Annika Thompson with me today. Great to have you with us, Annika. Annika is obviously our chief economist. And as always, I like to uh, throw to her first to get those important economic insights. We've got a couple of slides here, but Annika, feel free to add additional uh, input as I go or uh, on top of the slides that we've got here. So thanks for joining us, Annika. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Um, so I've asked to, what will be your two most important slides um, to talk about as, um, to support the January um, BRI. Um, I, think, I think this year will be the year that we really see labour force starting to weaken and we're already seeing that now. You can see that slight uptick in, at the end of the chart there. It's still really low by historic standards at 4.1%. But I would expect that to you know, be hitting around 4.5% by the middle of the year, which obviously isn't good for employees out there looking for a job, but it is good for inflation. So there is some positive news um, um, around rising unemployment. Um, and then the next slide, Patrick. Um, I think 2023 was the year of the consumer and the consumer getting very despondent. I think 2024 will be the year of businesses. Um, sort of joining the consumer in, in um, despondency, for want of a better word. Um, look, business conditions are still pretty good and they're still running above that long-term average. So these, um, this is the RBA's analysis where they measure it against long-term average, which I think is really useful to put everything in context. But I guess the key point here is that it's declining and it's declining pretty rapidly, especially since July last year. It was bumping around before that. But we're, we're on a pretty steady slope downwards. So the actual conditions of businesses are starting to match um, the confidence of, of businesses and the and, um, declining along with consumer confidence. So, and I think um, the data that Patrick's about to support, to show you will, will support what um, businesses are reporting to NAB. Yeah, definitely. Like a very quick summary, Patrick. Yeah, that's, no, that's great. And it, it, le it lends really well to the data that we've obviously, we see in the, the Credit Reporting Bureau. But also we're talking to, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of, of companies a, a month. Um, we've got an extensive, obviously, sales team that's talking, customer service, um, and I'm, I'm out speaking to you know journalists and um, business owners and leaders, et cetera. Every, everyone is certainly feeling the pinch at the moment, and there is that sense that it's gonna probably get worse before it gets better, but I, I'd like to think we're, we're, we're near the, uh, hopefully coming to near the, 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 the dip anyway, but there's, there's um, certainly some pain to come. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Annika, I always put you on the spot with uh, when we'll see when we'll see cuts, interest rate cuts, but we're, we're unlikely to see that until much later in the year at this stage based on the available data. Would that be, would that be fair? Yeah, I still put it in Q3. I haven't seen one of those people that have pushed it out to Q4. I think, and this is, you know, from based on our insights that we get through Creditor Watch, I think um, businesses are in worse shape than maybe what, the RBA and the ABS can see. You know, the ABS data is a little bit, um, a little bit lagging. Um, so I think unemployment is is on a fairly steep upward slope. And if it's at four and a half percent by mid-year, that'll be in front of the RBA's forecast. 
Um, and, and you know, one of their mandates is to maintain full employment, so they'll be watching that closely, and that might um, give them reason to cut in the third quarter. Yeah, I think there's probably a bit of game theory going on as well that they don't they don't want to say that hey, this is as bad as it gets, and and we're gonna we're gonna we've got some levers to pull to improve it, or you know, we think we've got it to a position where we want it. Um, I think they're probably worried about people then getting overconfident, going out and spending again. And, oh, and yeah, all that exactly. Work, right? So so every yeah. word they say is being harmed by bond traders out there. So they've got to be very, very careful about what they say. Absolutely. That's right. I think they're triple checking every statement um, that they put out there at the moment, which is um, rightly so after what we've been through. So let's jump into some of the, the data insights, the usual data insights that uh, we show on a on a monthly basis here that comes out of our business risk index, which we obviously put together on a, on a monthly basis other than... Um, uh, obviously through December, Jan, it's a, it's a bit of a mix. Um, let's have a look at the average value of, of invoices. So surprising, but not surprising, I would say. It's, it's obviously a, a hard graph to look at, but effectively what we're seeing is month on month for, for, for a long period of time now, we've seen significant um, uh, deterioration and, and reduction in the value of invoices. So we're, we're obviously collecting a huge amount of payment information from our from our customers and effectively we can see, you know, what's the average invoice value um, amongst other things. And, and we can see here that um, that the value of the invoices continues to deteriorate. Um, Jan though um, is, a, is, a, is a, an uptick, I would say, <laughs> a positive if you compared it to, to the month before. However, we know that trends, um, trends don't come in single months. We have to see what it looks like over time. But I, I certainly feel that we would be closer to the bottom of uh, of the cycle and, and we're sort of holding out for some some good news. Annika, how, how does this sort of um, affect, you know, various either industries or, or businesses, consumers out there from a, from a spend perspective? What's driving this? Yeah, I, well, I think that the lighter blue December bar is probably the most telling one and that really matches what happened with retail trade. We knew retail trade was going to go backwards in December because November is the big spend period because of the Black Friday sales now. But I think um, the rate at which we stopped spending money in December um, was quite surprising, even to you know a lot of people who watch the retail industry closely. Um, it's not just discretionary goods, but actually at, um, cafes and restaurants. It's one thing I watch closely because I think it talks to the site. A lot of Australians. Um, you know, we like eating out at cafes and restaurants. We traditionally eat out a lot in December in particular, um, but spend in that area went backwards, um, which I think is really telling us. I think it's a combination of households spending less, but also businesses, you know, spending less on, on corporate entertainment and, and the like. So there's certainly pullback in spending, you know, across all industries, um, but obviously affecting retail trade um, at the moment the most. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. My, my sense is that once there's some positive news, almost the you know first and second horizon that businesses and consumers are looking out for. One is, um, you know, not that we're going to get a guarantee from the uh, from the RBA as to when cuts are coming, but I think there'll be there'll be consensus within the media, within the financial circles, and possibly intimation from the RBA as to when we can start to expect rate cuts and, and that will drive you know obviously optimism and confidence within the business community and I think that's that's more likely to be sort of middle of the year June June July yeah and we'll be watching what happens overseas as well the US and UK will, will certainly move before or I can say or with near certainty they'll move before um, we will in Australia so that'll give us a yeah that's well. it and, and then obviously that second horizon will be when that that first cut actually does happen there's a, there's a big difference between uh, what gets reported and, and what what will actually happen, but but that will certainly bring um, actual relief rather than uh, just feeling relieved uh, when we start to see um, obviously uh, rate cuts come through. Hopefully Q3, Q4, hopefully sooner than that. To be honest, all right. Credit inquiries, uh, 5.2% uh, increase from last month, but pretty flat year on year. <laughs> we obviously had a really big jump through. Um, last calendar year above the sort of you know sort of three four year historical norm um, that that started to settle at the back half of the year um, and then December Jan back down to where we were 12 months ago it'll be interesting to see what happens here but when when you have less money being spent you see that in the invoice value generally you see 
less um, inquiries being made. Um, an inquiry is, you know, a, a, um, a, a customer or an applicant applying for either trade credit or finance, um, or a, um, a supplier performing a search on, on an existing customer, for example. External administrations, obviously spoken about a huge amount still. We are definitely above where we were um, pre-COVID, and you can you can see that by going all the way back to obviously the 2019s. Anyone can remember. <laughs> excuse me, all the way back to then. Um, but of course, we know that there was this huge dip through 2020, 2021, and a recovery in 2022. So it's certainly tough out there for businesses. It's definitely more businesses that would be going into administration than you know than, than pre-COVID, but there's also um, a number of businesses that'll, that'll be going into administration um, as a result of you know hibernating or or being somewhat of a zombie business and, and, and possibly being abandoned business as well. So there's a bit of a mix there of the types of businesses going into administration. You know that the ATO, and I'll touch on that in a little bit, is, is a lot more um, a lot more active than than they were historically too. Um, trade payment defaults are a really leading indicator of um, of uh, obviously coming delinquency. If a default is registered against a business, um, what we typically find is that they have about a two and a half times more uh, higher probability of going into default, uh, sorry, going into administration and failing than a business without that. And that probability grows significantly as multiple defaults are lodged. So we see certainly a, a big increase in defaults back up to and above pre-COVID norms. Um, we expect that to continue to rise, similar to administrations as well, um, as, as, as conditions are just far tougher out there and businesses will certainly be um, hard pressed to make payments to all of their suppliers, um, either at all or, or, or obviously on time. So um, for those of you that do use Creditor Watch, um, make sure you're monitoring all of your customers, even if they're a long-term customer or you know that they're, they're, they're in, fine, in fine shape. Um, the last thing you want to know is, the last thing you want to find out is that they went into administration, but there were you know, alerts sent along the way. So if you're monitoring them, we will send you alerts as key indicators like um, a, a trade payment default or a court action that we look at next gets lodged against that particular entity. Court actions following a sort of similar um, trail to administrations and um, uh, payment defaults, a, a little less, um, less jagged than, than those two previous slides, a little bit more consistent. And this, this will really be interesting to watch um, to see if the ATO and um, the big banks start to use uh, court actions, court judgments as a way to collect from, uh, from their customers. They're yet to really come back online. <laughs> <laughs> All right, industry insights. So spoken about external administrations, you can see that we are well above where we were um, pre-COVID. Um, if we look at the rolling annual external administrations, you can start to see some of the industries. And Annika, I'm going to put you on the spot here and get you to talk through it as I as I cough in the background. Okay. Um, well, I gave you a bit of a, um, you know, a heads up on, on the challenges in the food and beverage services industry, um, and that sector, you know, is well ahead in terms of um, external administrations um, compared to all other industries, um, even without sort of. Um, falling spend in that sector. They usually do sit up near the top up there with um, the construction sector. Um, they face another number of challenges. One of them is high rents. Obviously, cafes and restaurants tend to be in high foot traffic areas, so rent is a big proportion, makes a big proportion of their, um, their overall um, expenses and um, labour costs. Labour costs are still, um, you know, running pretty high, um, and particularly with the federal government uh, pulling back on um, on overseas student visas, it might just make it a little bit more challenging to find labour. It might just just make make, make that side of um, um their expense line just that, just that little bit harder. And obviously, there's you know the cost of food and beverage and alcohol as well is going up. So lots and lots of challenges in the food and beverage sector um, in conjunction with declining demand. Um, public admin and safety is a bit of an odd one. Most of us see you know sitting there at number two, but um, sort of ignore the public admin part, the government part, but you know, there's a lot of safety organisations out there. Think about all the you know, lollipop um, 
people um, um, uh, doing the traffic out there and all the roadworks, um, lots and lots of pop-up companies that come and go um, pretty quickly. So that's why that, that, that sector has um, a higher rate and obviously the construction sector. So you're seeing a lot of particularly smaller um, businesses, not so much the larger construction industry, larger, larger construction companies. They seem to have stabilised a bit because they've passed on their higher costs to their customers. But it's those smaller construction firms that just have less market power where we're still seeing um, high levels of insolvency. Thanks for that, Annika. Um, yeah, this is a this is a really good one to to get a feel for you know the, the real impact on on those various uh, industries. You know, construction and and even the safety one, as Annika said. And in boom times, you see a lot of people leave the safety full time jobs, move into you know almost um, you know one or two man bands, startup companies, and then when there's a a dip, they go back to the safety of uh, full time employment and obviously put their companies into administration. So we've seen that happen quite a bit. Mining, it's obviously been a lot happening in that space. At the moment, with uh, with some uh, critical mineral prices dropping significantly of late, um, and then obviously drop all the way to the end. Financial services performing well from a, an external administration perspective, despite the fact that there's certainly a um, an increase in in overdues and um, across both corporate and and uh, mortgage, for example. If we look at payment arrears, this is looking at the proportion of an industry that's paying 60 days in arrears. Construction historically is often number one or number two, and there's no different at the moment. Um, the other the other industries though um, are starting to uh, climb and, and get a bit closer, particularly food and beverage, as we can see <coughs> that Annika has spoken about. Uh, retail, obviously a really big one in Australia, um, and then coming through in the middle there, transport, postal and warehousing seems to be improving. They, they've been sort of closer to the uh, Top three, you know, slowest payers, highest risk of late, but um, I think we've seen uh, petrol prices come under control and 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 the the, the industry in general start to um, uh, moderate a little bit as well, which is positive. And the big one that we like to show ATO tax default. So the one thing I'll say, this isn't this isn't shouldn't be a shock. It, it's obviously designed to shock visually, but um, you know the ATO has had the ability to register tax defaults for a, a couple of years now, and they've made sure to get the, the practice and process and structures right. And we're now starting to see them register defaults um, far more often um, than they they were historically, which <laughs> which is only a good thing because obviously um, they're registering them against companies that owe a hundred thousand dollars or more in in overdue tax. Um, and have basically buried their head in the sand. So, so they're not making contact with the ATO, not answering calls, not responding to emails and, uh, and letters. So that they are prime uh, companies that are likely to go into administration if the ATO doesn't get to them first. So it's good to have that called out. If you see a, um, an ATO tax default on a credit report or you receive an alert um, from Creditor Watch that someone, that a business has had a tax default, um, I would be doing everything possible to, to, to mitigate your risk as fast as possible as well, because uh, we'll have some stats um, probably in the coming months, but there's a high correlation between a tax default and a, and, and a business failure, or a company failure administration very soon after. All right, so the last couple of slides to look at now looks at the regional analysis. Um, and we, we always like to look at best performing and, and worst performing. And just as a <laughs> bit of a reminder on that, so we we eff effectively score and rank every single region in Australia. It's about 300 odd regions from, from best to worst. So a high business risk index is a good thing. It means you've got a low uh, risk or a low probability of, of failure. And the first one we're looking at here is those with at least 5,000 businesses or more. So as you can appreciate, there are some regional areas that only have maybe dozens of businesses in them. Um, we're looking at the really big uh, high population regions, those that have got 5,000 businesses or more. Um, what do we see here? We've got um, typically you find non-capital cities. Am I correct, Annika? You find that the capital cities are, are generally probably the, the average to below average compared to sort of um, either regional or, or well-to-do areas? Yeah, well, those, inner, those inner city areas, which are listed down the bottom there for the city, Melbourne City, they're the CBD. They've got you know, a big mix of businesses, so you'd expect them to be yeah, somewhere in the middle, whereas 
you know, regional areas like Ballarat, um, you know, towns are very, um, they, they have sort of only a few industries, so um, either perform very well because of the few industries that they have, or the other end of the scale, they perform very poorly because of the few industries that, um, that, that they're dominated by. But a lot of these areas, I'll always um, say that it's, hard, it's really hard to see how they're similar. Um, you know, the Yarra Ranges compared to Townsville, what, what's similar to those areas, but they tend to have older populations, will have less debt, so they'll have more discretionary spending, so they can maintain their spending in the local businesses, so that, that all helps. Some of them um, are very reliant on local tourism, so I think as people go to Bali less and skiing in Japan at a, at a lower rate because of the cost, areas like Cairns and Townsville, Ballarat, Yarra Ranges, and you know, big local tourism areas, so they sort of benefit, um, oddly enough. Um, and then, yeah, but mostly they've got older populations with lower levels of debt and that, that's um, their greatest strength. Yeah, and there's typically not all of them, obviously, but um, we'll have <coughs> lower um, lower instances of, uh, of commercial rent prices, for example, as well. And a, and a somewhat yeah. lack of competition, you know, they're fairly well established businesses in these in these more regional areas than, than in the cities, obviously. Yeah, and right. of course we get to, the, uh, the worst performing regions, the top 10 here. This really hasn't changed, and I've been saying this every month for almost probably three years now. It is all populated around Southwest Sydney and, um, and the Coolangatta, Gold Coast, Surface Paradise. Um, two very different regions and, and um, performing poorly for, for different reasons as well. Um, we, we know that uh, the, the Gold Coast, Coolangatta area is, is very much a, a boom bust sort of town and has been for, for a long time. Um, high property rates, high instances of, of insolvencies, both, both personal insolvency but also um, commercial insolvency as well. Um, and, and Southwest Sydney, uh, typically, you know, still because it's part of Sydney, high, high cost from a rent, mortgage, um, house price perspective, but, you know, traditionally a, probably a lower socioeconomic income area as well, so harder hit in, in downturns. Um, anything to add there, Annika? No, I think you covered it all. I guess the only other thing, South East Queensland, um, the rental market's still performing really well. So, you know, um, retail rents are still um, are still um, well from a landlord's perspective. So even if some of these businesses are doing okay and tourism trade is up, sometimes it is just the cost of rent in those high foot traffic areas in, in the Gold Coast that, that really... Um, make these businesses become unstuck and unsustainable. Excellent. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our business risk index that we've presented. Um, thank you for joining. If you've got any questions, please lodge them in the, um, in the question section and we can get back to you. Um, but otherwise, have a fantastic um, rest of, what are we in, Feb already? End of Feb? Um, yeah, a couple more days left. And uh, we will uh, we will see you very soon. Annika, thank you as always for joining us. Great to have you and um, and your uh, insights for everyone to rely on. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone. Cool.